My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And today's topic is one that I truly love, creativity. Now, I think I've talked about this in the past, but it bears repeating that, you know, when you're a little kid, like, you are creative. I mean, we spend half our time imagining things, right? And then the system and life beats out our creativity and the people who manage to retain their creativity or rediscover their creativity, they do really big things. Creativity is an incredible power. And so it is an area that I've always been interested in because I was a really creative kid. I wrote a sonata when I was in fourth grade, believe it or not. And then I found myself like in the business world and I definitely didn't I don't know, I just didn't draw on my creativity or the creativity that I had had as a kid. I just didn't know where to find it. And then later on, I was able to recapture that. And I found that it actually, it really sets me apart and allows me to do things that I couldn't have done otherwise. So it's a topic that I love. And, you know, entrepreneurs have to be creative. Entrepreneurial thinkers have to be creative. So this is a topic that is very much for this show. And my guest to talk about this is a very special person. His name is Seth Goldenberg. He's the author of a book called Radical Curiosity, Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures. Now, Seth is a designer, a curator, an entrepreneur who harnesses the power of questioning to catalyze innovation and cultural change. He's the founder and CEO of Curiosity & Company, a -a one-of-a-kind bookstore, experience laboratory, and design venture studio, and that is based in Jamestown, Rhode Island. He's also the creator of The Ideas Salons, invitational thought leader retreats that tackle the essential questions of our time. So he's just one of these guys. I, I, I met him, actually. He threw a dinner in New York before the launch of the book, and he invited a group of people. I didn't you know, sort of know who was going to be in the room, and it was cool. Actually, our, our friend Gretchen Rubin, who's been on the show in the past, she was there, so I got to meet her, which was exciting. But Seth gets up and talks, and he's one of these people who I hadn't ever heard of, and then he tells his story and what he works on, and you're sort of like, this guy, I could spend all day with him. And in fact, our conversation, as you'll hear later, we just really hit it off. He is a really down to earth guy, but also he's a creator and he thinks outside the box. And so he kind of is in the clouds a little bit at the same time, but in the best ways. And in our conversation, the things you're going to learn are these. First of all, we're going to talk about (laughs) this notion that Seth talks about, that curiosity is on the verge of extinction and that our modern world has inadvertently been designed to eradicate it. So we're going to talk about that Then we're going to talk about the danger of putting structure around everything. And it's funny because he's a designer and I'm sort of an entrepreneur business person. I want to put structure on everything. And he just tells me, don't do that because it can kill curiosity. And we're going to talk about the importance of reinvention. And I think right now, especially, you know, we're in the fall and we're getting fired up for this time of year when we're building and doing things. You got to be ready to reinvent because you never know what's going to come down the old pipeline. Now, my small ask this week is to share this episode and then make sure you're subscribed, okay? Because I wanna make sure you're not missing any episodes. Season eight is chock full of good content. You're gonna love what we have coming down the pike. So share, subscribe, maybe throw in a rating. I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, and now that I've done that, it's time to start the interview. And as you know, I start every interview with the same question and Seth did not escape, so I asked him this. What is a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? It's a great one. So for me, uh, I began my own studio about 12 years ago. And the decision to move from being a team member or a part of a pre-existing organization to deciding to start an organization really was actually, I realized in hindsight, it was a decision to have an agency of voice and a decision to have authorship over 
what would come next. And that started a whole trajectory of the life of an entrepreneur, but also having a point of view, not being a part of, but constructing and making a space for other things to happen. You use the word studio there, and I'm curious because that's a specific word that I don't actually have a viewpoint of what that means. So to unpack that. Yeah. So as a, I mean, I began my uh, my creative life as an oil painter. Actually, I uh, attended Rhode Island School of Design and and was in the uh, painting program there. And so I come from a kind of pathology of the fine arts. And as I progressed and entered a professional life, that evolved into a design practice, a kind of design strategy, design thinking. But for sure, no matter what way it gets expressed, a studio is a creative ritual, a creative space. And of course, studio in the arts comes from a place of study. And whether you're making creative expressions through aesthetics or working on big complex challenges as we now do in my company it is a very sacred space to slow down time and study and imagine okay first of all i'm going to admit to everybody that i didn't realize the word studio came from study so if we if we stopped our conversation now i would have learned something from you but i know we have a lot more to come uh you let's just dive into it because your your new book radical curiosity is out now and you talk about the fact that curiosity is on the verge of extinction and our modern world has been inadvertently designed in some studio as it were to eradicate curiosity so that is a big statement unpack that for us yeah no it's you know i think the first the first section of the book, I, l- I love that we're starting here because it's really the foundation of the overall kind of argument and hypothesis. I set up a section called Curiosity as an Endangered Species. That's essentially the first chapter, the first section of the book. And I think that we, we in our studio, my team and I, have had the privilege of working with almost every sector, every industry from finance to health care to education we've been working in tourism and government and time and time again we continue to find that in all different types of leadership and i'm very aware of and appreciate that much of what the conversations you host in uh, fomo sapiens is about decision making about how we make decisions as leaders i i find that we don't really honor and embrace the very unique art and science of how to ask deep, deep, essential questions. And without that, with the absence of really harnessing the origin of a question, it can change the trajectory of billions of dollars or decades of work or rework. We've decided to really hone in on that observation and develop a methodology to help teach leaders and organizations how to ask great questions and understand how to excavate the importance of questioning. And not just passive questioning, but we, when we say radical curiosity, radical comes from the kind of Latin root of radicalis, which really means root, to get to the roots of things. I think we too often, even when we're asking questions, We scurry on the surface and avoid the hard work of kind of getting down to the layers of the onion of where really the source code is. And that's really what radical curiosity is all about. So give me an example, because this notion that curiosity is, you know, disappearing, like how does that play out? in a practical setting that we all sort of live with on a day in, day out. And I'm, I'm just thinking to, to some point, it's like nobody remembers facts anymore. We just Google everything and assume it's true. Like that is like a very, Patrick, I, that by the way, that, that was not radicalist because that's pretty obvious, but take us into the radicalist zone in, in, in how this is playing out. Absolutely. No, I love it. I mean, uh, there's two examples I often give. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, you, you, I often love this anecdote, you know, a company X, Fortune 50 company, learns about this new idea of the Internet of Things. It's 
sexy. It's a buzzword. Everybody's excited about it. And we say, well, we should probably get into that business. Let's get into the Internet of Things business. And now we get together as a management team. We say, well, we don't really know much about it. We should we should get some thought leaders involved. Let's, let's have a symposium. Let's get a conference. Let's get a bunch of smarty pants together. Now, okay, we're going to have them at our corporate headquarters. Now, all of a sudden, we need to host them. Now, I'm on the committee for parking to figure out where the people who might have an idea. And what happens is we wind up getting so many degrees away from the origin. Now, my project is to manage the parking of the conversation, right? The, the actual logistics. And I think it just happens operationally, inadvertently. We've become kind of managers of tactics. And it's rare that a strategic origin point stays and hangs in the air long enough to even question, are we asking the right question? Um, and, you know, one, one way I talk about this also is, uh, even, even in a, m- a more revolutionary sense, take Obamacare. When Obamacare was being brought to the Supreme Court, we were hosting a salon at the time, a gathering of some of our colleagues and network of troublemakers who love questioning. One of the things we discussed is at all of the debate, with all of the discourse, all of the attention on Obamacare being challenged, we weren't actually really having a conversation about what is health. We were having a conversation about who pays for it. The big debate is really who gets the bill, who gets the invoice. But that still stays at the procurement and plumbing of what the real issue is. We skipped the stage when the nation had a, a societal discourse about our values and said, This is what we believe life looks like. We believe we should live to 100 and the last six weeks should take 95% of all health care. We don't even have that conversation. We're just discussing who gets the plumbing of the invoice. So I think whether it's the daily operation of my silly uh, you know, uh, parking committee of day-to-day operations and tactics or something as important as the very point and value proposition of health, We seem to have kind of gotten confused and lost the discipline to start at the origin. FOMO. FOMO. Is it? Let me let me ask a question. Part of it, what it feels like I'm hearing, and you'll tell me if I'm on the right track or you can tell me I'm wrong, even though it's my show, (laughs) is that when you have these very big, you know, it could be a big problem, small problem, but when you when you jump into the world of, you know, where curiosity exists, which is not structured and it's messy and it could, people can say things that might be wrong and they might take risks. A lot of times people immediately try to impose structure as a way of addressing the fear. It's like, oh, I don't like this. It's uncomfortable. Let's put some structure. Let's figure out who's going to organize the parking. And then all of a sudden you spend so much more time in the structure place that you never achieve the objective in the first place. Is that fair? I think that's a very, very big part of it, and I'm glad you called it out. I mean, I think, again, especially just very really uh, uh, respectful to the decision-making thesis, and I love that this is part of the theme of your your platform. I think we've designed the 21st century corporation to be an apparatus that forces us to lose the plot. (laughs) <laughs> to your point, right? I mean, I think if if uh, suddenly the work becomes how to even do the work, <laughs> and we we're distant from the actual essence of the work, right? Um, I mean, I think you know. Also, I think in more cultural values and kind of uh, social systems and the way society behaves we seem not to reconcile contradictions that we've designed. So no one believes that uh, at scale national public education is working, but will throw you in jail for truancy if you don't attend. Right? So we, we live through these kind of paradoxes in which we, uh, we're so kind of immersed inside the techniques of management and operations that we almost don't have 
the courage or give ourselves license to question the very premise. Yeah, it makes sense. And I'm just thinking as you're talking, I'm like, you can tell you were educated as a painter and I went to an MBA program because I do want to, it's like, I want to put structure. I've learned to do less of that, but I do. It's like structure is a solution for me. Whereas as a creator, like you're like, let's question it all. Let's, you know, we do something that hasn't been done and take a risk. And you cite Miles Davis, right? So Miles Davis is, a, I'm obviously a huge fan. If everybody wants to listen to one album this weekend, listen to Miles Ahead. It's my favorite Miles Davis. My brother's a jazz musician. He indoctrinated me into the world of Miles Davis. And you cite him as a example of true radical curiosity. So what does he do? Well, what did he do right in his career to, to, to continue that process? Uh, well, I, lo I love that. I mean, I think there's, there's something really remarkable about mm -hmm. the essence of improv that is very freeing to take that very structure you're talking about found in maybe MBA and kind of make it work on your own terms. So to take jazz, bebop, classical, you know, melody, and kind of break them down to their core, almost kind of like first principles, Aristotle kind of periodic table, right? To take all this structure and say, well, what's, what's the key building block inside of that? Let me break it down and then mix it in new ways that work for me and the new to create novel solutions. I think that's what Jose Andres and Fran Adria do in molecular, uh, molecular um, gastronomy cooking, right? To say, well, here's the recipe, here's the ingredients. Let's scientifically deconstruct the pieces and then recombine them in new ways. And I think, by the way, I believe that's what businesses need to do today. I think businesses are in a remix deconstruct and resynthesis kind of situation where the kind of over structured the over production of all these layers and kind of administrative um, nonsense has because it's helped us drift away from the core it's almost like to get back to that essence we need to take improv in music and molecular gastronomy kinds of techniques and say well let's get back to those radicalist roots and ask questions and say, maybe there's new ways these things can fit together. How can business models become almost like improv jazz? Yeah, and reinvention, you know, think about Miles Davis. Miles Davis never went out of style. Like Madonna has been, I don't know, she's been at it for 40, 50 years. Why, I mean, if she was still seeing Material Girl now, I mean, listen, <laughs> I'd show up for it, but she would not be relevant. And so, reinvention, whether it's in your career or your life. I just had this conversation with mm. a, a past guest of the short Beth Ferreira, and we talked about it in a prior episode with Max Rose, Congressman Max Rose. Mm. Reinvention, it is probably the most important kind of superpower that you can have in a world of rapid change. Yeah, and and that and even to to desire that, even to desire reinvention and to be good at reinvention requires curiosity. Right. So being curious is a kind of restlessness. It's never to kind of stop and pause on your laurels, but to say, is there more? How can I reflect the times? Right. I mean, we talk about uh, Miles. I mean, Nina Simone uh, has the great quote that, you know, it's an artist's job to reflect the, the moment, to re reflect the times that we're in. So I also think part of curiosity and radical curiosity and that reinvention you're talking about, even Madonna is a great case study. Great artists, great designers, great entrepreneurs are also reinventing to be relevant to how the context is changing. I think that's sometimes something that businesses or government forgets to do, that the, contents, the context itself as a kind of aquarium and fishbowl is also in motion. All right, Seth. So here's the deal. I know that you're a very expensive guy to hire as a speaker or as a <laughs> studio or whatever. So I'm going to, I mean, because I have you right now in my 
public forum. I want to get a free service from you. So what I want you to do is teach me and everybody who's listening how we can be more curious right now. Like, what do we got to do? That's great. Yeah. Well, so actually, I'd love to maybe as a way to answer that, uh, if, if just because you're, you're being so bold and so intimate with me, I'll, I'll reciprocate. I love your, your inv- invocation of your MBA. Mm. So MBA, sometimes we forget that the master's degree, the highest credential in the land of being a business leader is a master's of administration. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) I never thought about that. Right. There you go. So what I have found, (laughs) one of the things we talk about in the book that, that I really get quite passionate about is I think that one of the things that happened is if you look at knowledge over time, the explosion of our capacity to identify and collect and codify knowledge with the advent of technology, we move over eras of time, is extraordinary. I mean, it is an extraordinary time to be alive. We have entire Hollywood film studios that fit in our pockets. But one of the outcomes of that is that all of knowledge is accessible. And Really, what leadership has come in part to mean is to administer and facilitate existing knowledge like a a blueprint and a playbook. Leaders and leadership in some fashions has come to mean the facilitation and placement of plugging the holes with existing knowledge. Curiosity is about also the pursuit of inventing new knowledge. I mean, we forget a lot of folks see research as very nerdy, very specialized, happens over there. It's the R&D group. It might be deep science. It might be deep long-term invention, long processes. But research is a form of creation of new knowledge. And I think one of the things that I would advise, uh, because you've you've asked such a beautiful question, that there is almost like two timelines that organizations and leaders need to balance, especially as it relates to decision-making. We need to operate and distribute existing knowledge, but simultaneously be in the development of new knowledge. And those things are nuanced and different, but are needed to happen simultaneously in order to keep doing that refresh and reinvention you were just talking about. And I think sometimes what happens is, to your point earlier, organizations get so complex and we're always firefighting the thing that's coming at us right now that we wind up by default prioritizing the operationalizing of the existing knowledge just to get through the day. And slowly, inadvertently, we deprioritize the work of creating new knowledge, which is really where curiosity is flourishing and is fed as a desire. So I think I would be always thinking about diverse timetables and the diverse ways that knowledge operates, not to administer only what we know, but to be in pursuit of maybe what we don't know. FOMO. FOMO. The subtitle of your book is Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures. Let me just say that again because it's, it's, it's a lot of words. Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures. Now, commonly held beliefs, you know, we talk about this on the show. It's the idea of herd thinking, which is part of FOMO. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like everybody's doing this, so it must be right. I'm going to go and do that with them. How do you you know, how do you do that? How do you question those beliefs? Because it's, you know, it can be very difficult and uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's happening all around us, especially now. And it's one of the reasons uh, I wrote the book now. And in fact, uh, focused on its development during the pandemic, because Mm -hmm. it felt like during the pandemic, so many of our social systems were facing a kind of existential crisis. 
right? What we thought was public health or our capacity for health suddenly felt like it disappeared. The, the predictability of the workplace, the ability to go to school, all, all the kind of public sphere infrastructure seemed to just be collapsing. Um, and I think that uh, for me, questioning commonly held beliefs even requires being able to see the patterns and often those camouflaged patterns that are imprinted in the way that we live. I think, you know, I talk about we are born into what I call legacy narratives. We inherit social and cultural behaviors and patterns by generations before us. And sometimes we don't even question them because they've become so ingrained, we think they are unquestionable. But whether that is, you know, intense topics from racism to gender to gun violence, the big issues that we are contending with today, I believe that we are kind of going through a kind of growing pain between legacy narratives and emerging new challenger narratives. And what we're, why there is friction, why we see these kind of spectacular uh, moments like Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement, it's almost like our nation is reconciling with which narrative it wants to become. We are actively, whether it's by design or by convergence of circumstance, we are questioning the commonly held beliefs that are the undercarriage operating system of our culture right now. And when we see these things in the news, these are just kind of like what I call upending indicators, right? So it's interesting to almost kind of be a detective and be reading the news with this kind of this set of goggles or this lens in mind to say, well, that's happening because the whole country is wrestling with who we want to become next. You're right. And if you think about the notion of radicalis, the root, Everything that happens, you know, in the world, it's not like just things just randomly happen. Generally, you can go back and trace those things. And if you do the work of it, which I think few of us do, right? We're, we're such, a, especially as Americans, we're about the now and the future. It's just our culture. Whereas if you go to other places that have longer history, people spend much more time thinking about what happened 500 years ago. But if you don't do what you're saying, you're missing, I mean, you're, that's a great opportunity to be curious. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Seth, what I, you know, what I, what I appreciate about all of this, especially the subtitle of the book talks about imagining flourishing futures. And the great thing about that is that there's an inherent optimism because nobody's like, let me like, let's think of the future. Like, let me just paint you a picture of despair, like a dystopian kind of thing. I hate those kinds of movies, by the way, I don't need a dystopian future. I need a nice one. <laughs> but obviously it's not easy. And so, you know, as somebody who having got to know you a little bit of time, uh, spent some time with you at dinner and other things like that, I, I see that you are as a, as a creator and as a person who's curious, you know, you are focusing on optimism. How do we cultivate optimism in times where, you know, it can be easy to feel discouraged? Yeah, no, I, I love that. And, and <laughs> I'm with you on that subgenre of films. In fact, uh, <laughs> I, I talk about that in the book. I mean, if you if you look at, I mean, dystopia has its own multi-hundred billion dollar box office take, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, so I think the last question in exchange, we talked about the first half of that, the, the secondary title. And I love that you're kind of zeroing in on flourishing futures. And I had a lot of debate with uh, people I trust about even using that term, flourishing futures. And I think for me, uh, it, it's an optimism that I carry, but it's also a real activism. Uh, there's a kind of activist urgency that I keep very close to my heart and to my thinking. And I think there's a pathology of the activist kind of protest in which we begin the narrative arc with a critique of the, the fault or the breakage or the um, uh, injustice 
in many of our systems. But often that protest falls short of then articulating what an alternative could actually look like. And as an artist, as a designer, as a visual and kind of creative uh, person, we, I and my team, all the kind of ensemble of collaborators that I enjoy our practice through, we are makers first and foremost. So we believe that you can make or unmake and remake anything. Right? This lens of how we see the world is not as the burden of an inherited narrative, but we can write any narrative that's next. And so part of that kind of combination of optimism and activism is actually the best way to progress far past the protest is to paint the picture, sometimes quite literally, to literally draw, to literally visualize what an insanely beautiful future is possible. What does flourishing even look like? We're very good at being kind of armchair critics in this country. But we're not so good at kind of saying, what if it looked like this? And actually, I find it's a lot more fun. So when you say, you know, what would it take to be optimistic? I almost feel like we should try it out a little bit. It might be quite infectious to have the celebratory party of just describing what a beautiful future could look like. It's kind of infectious. I love that. And by the way, that's how you get people to want to spend time with you because it is the it's the aspirational leader. Maybe the negative people and the scaremongers get more clicks, but it's the aspirational leaders who are remembered. The book is Radical Curiosity, Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures. If you want to find out more about Seth's work, you can go to curiosityand.company. That's curiosity and then spell it out, A-N-D, dot company. Or you can find him on Instagram at Goldenberg Seth. Seth Goldenberg, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.